this talk. So Eric Madsen is a uh, professor at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Institution, um, and he's a computational biologist. And his team works on developing methods to analyze data generated from DNA of immune cells, viruses, and uh, microorganisms in the environment. Um, he's an expert in Bayesian phylogenetics, and if we're lucky, he'll be able to explain his lab's current logo with a robot chicken. Uh, with a child riding it, waving this pencil menacingly. Um, and today he's going to talk to us about analyzing the space of TCR using optimal transport. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little disturbed to hear that you say it menacingly, um, but uh, I'm going to assume people can hear my screen unless someone yelps. So today I'm going to talk about analyzing the space with TCRs using optimal transport. But uh, first, I would just like to say thank you all for your work on air. Um, I think it's really essential, and I, it takes a lot of commitment. And I'm sorry I'm not there. Um, I've been focusing on these two monsters. So. Today, I'm going to be talking mostly about optimal transport for TCRs, and this is unpublished work, so I'd really love to get your feedback. Uh, and then just sort of imagine that we are actually at La Jolla, and we can go out for beers, and I'll tell you about a few other projects we're working on. So the goal of this first part of the talk is to define and learn from a rich space of TCRs. And this work was led by Brandon Olson, who got married and changed his name to Steele. He is now graduated. Uh, and also in collaboration with Phil Bradley and Paul Thomas and Stefan Schotkin, who are at St. Jude's. So this is an air meeting. This is great. I don't have to say the following things. There's a lot of TCR data. This data has rich structure, and we'd like to learn about immunology from these data. And there's many ways of analyzing TCR sequence data, but yet I don't feel like we quite yet have TCR goggles. And I want TCR goggles. Uh, so how can we get TCR goggles? So I'm going to propose that we can define a space in which the TCRs live, and then we can work to do analysis and comparison in that space. So let's talk about what a space means. So what we're going to do is define the space using a distance, where we have a collection of points and distances between them. In our application, these points are going to be TCRs, and the distances I'll describe next. But I want to emphasize first that this is not points in a Euclidean space. There are no coordinates for each of these points. They're just sitting in an abstract space. All we have are points and distances between them. This is also different than thinking about TCRs as a list of characteristics, such as what their BD and J genes are, their CDR3 length is, and so on and so forth. So the distance that we will use is called TCR dist. It was developed by Phil Bradley in this paper. And the idea of TCR dist at a very high level is we have two TCRs, TCR1 and TCR2. And <clears throat> we're, we compute a distance between them with the idea that if this number is small, if this distance is small, then these are two similar TCRs. If it's large, then they're very different TCRs. In a little bit more detail, what this does is it looks at all the different CDRs that are part of this T cell receptor aligns them, computes a, an amino acid similarity score, sums that up, and you get this number. So if we have this TCR dist and our space defined by TCR dist, how are we going to learn in this space? Let's look at a cartoon. So here we have an example of two different TCRs, TCR repertoires. We have X's, which are uh, TCRs from one repertoire. And I've put this sort of loop around to say sort of this is the space occupied by this TCR sample. We also have triangles, which is another uh, repertoire set. And one of the tasks we might want to do in such a space is figure out what's going on down here. We want to find stuff like this that's sort of special for this one repertoire compared to the second repertoire. So just to say it uh, a little bit more formally, let's try to find groups of sequences that are typical of their own repertoire but are atypical of a second repertoire. So for that, we're going to use the framework of optimal transport. I'll motivate this by thinking about a metaphor with soldiers in the battlefield, which is actually the original motivation for this type of work. So here, imagine that we have 
uh, soldiers at different locations on a battlefield. Here there's 60 here, there's 90 here, 150 here. And as generals, we would like to move these soldiers to a new configuration with 120 soldiers here, 90 here, and 90 here. And we'd like to do that in a way that requires the minimum amount of transport for these soldiers. And so hence the name Optimal Transport. So you might have heard of something related uh, that's called the Earth Movers Distance. So if you know about that, you can just sort of imagine that we're doing Earth Movers Distance, but we're using a different interpretation, which we'll describe later. Optimal transport is what mathematicians say. Uh, Earth Movers Distance is what computer scientists say. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so we have these distances and we have these soldiers and we're the idea is that we're going to be making a correspondence between the soldiers in their original location and the soldiers in their final location. And that's going to be a really important point, which I'll repeat later. So in a little bit more formality, let's imagine uh, the following formulation of a transportation problem. So in that, we have these three locations, and we know in advance what are the numbers of soldiers we want in the first configuration and in the second configuration. We also have a distance matrix, which is the distance from each of these uh, locations to the other one. So let's just, as an example, let's say we have 40 soldiers that were moving from this point to this point here. Then we would put 40 in here, and to calculate that contribution to the total transportation cost, we would multiply that 40 times this distance. And let's say there's 20 in this entry. Well, so that would uh, so then we would multiply this that 20 by this distance and so on and so forth. And we would sum all those up. And so that looks like this. We just have the sum of these transportation matrix entries times the distance. And the other important thing is that we make sure that these transportation matrices have the correct row and column sums. We had 60 soldiers and we need each of those 60 soldiers to go somewhere. So we need these totals to total up to 60. So let's bring back TCRs. Of course, we're thinking about, instead of soldiers, we're thinking about T cell receptors. Uh, there are um, quantity that we have counts for each of these T cell receptors. Uh, and then we have uh, counts for each of the other T cell receptors in a second repertoire. And because we're using TCR disks, we can minimize uh, sorry, we can compute distances between these different TCRs. So our goal now is to minimize the amount of transport required in this space defined by TCR dist in order to move one repertoire into another. And this is a key point here, which is that this gives us a correspondence between sequences of different repertoires, even if none of those sequences are identical. So here, we, if, if we did uh, most of our optimal transport between these two T cell receptors, there would make a correspondence between these two even though those aren't identical sequences. Great. So back to one of our goals, which is to find groups of sequences that are typical of their repertoire, but atypical of a second repertoire. We can phrase this now in terms of optimal transport by saying we're interested in finding groups of sequences that are close to one another according to the CR dist, but have to be transported a long way to their corresponding sequence in a second repertoire. And so that would be this cluster here. And we're going to call groups of sequences lonely that have to be transported a long way to the corresponding sequences in a second repertoire. So if we have a cluster of sequences, we can talk about a loneliness score, which is the sum of this uh, total of this um, the loneliness score. So, so the sum of the distances that each one of the sequences have to transport to their corresponding sequences in the second repertoire. OK. So in a little bit more detail, our pipeline looks like this. So you start by calculating pairwise TCR disks. We use this fast sync horn and tree regularized optimal transport. That's a really important detail, but it is a detail nonetheless. Uh, we find very lonely TCRs. And I emphasize that these are uh, TCRs that are lonely with respect to a second repertoire. There might be in a cluster of lonely sequences. Uh, and then we use segmented regression to find a cluster of sequences around X with high total loneliness. And so uh, just to give a quick visual about this last thing, what we're doing here is we're looking at annuli, so sort of rings of increasing radius, and we're looking at the mean loneliness for each of these annuli. And we, as we increase the radius, we see 
how that mean loneliness goes down, and then at some point it hits a break point, and then we can identify that with something called segmented regression. So we're, let's try this on some Paul Thomas lab data. They were interested in intestinal intraepithelial lymphocytes in mice. They have some CD4 cells, they have some CD8 cells, uh, and they also have cells that are sometimes called double negative. I guess the correct word is CD8 alpha alpha. So these have PCRs, don't have CD4, don't have CD8, uh, CD8 beta, but do have CD8 alpha. And these are somewhat mysterious uh, cells and we'd like to understand them better. So here just the question is, are there parts of PCR space that are commonly occupied in the double negative repertoires, but not in the CD4s? And the answer is yes. And we find three clusters, which we'll call Tremont, Revere, and Ida. We will display these um, as logo plots like this. And this is, I think, a really neat tool if people don't already use it. So let's say you're interested in calculating some summary information about a collection of sequences that could potentially be of different lengths. You can do a multiple sequence alignment, build a profile HMM using Hammer, and then visualize it using this thing called Skyline. And so this motif display, the height of, of these different letters represents how, uh, how much preference there is for that amino acid in that multiple sequence alignment. We're also showing uh, what the V-gene usage was. For this uh, first cluster, which is Tremont, it was 100% 1601. So let's look at the different clusters. Uh, we have Tremont, Revere, uh, which uses a, a much more flexible set of V-genes and has this GTIS motif in the middle of the CDR3. Also Ida, which is actually one shorter than these others. You can see 15 versus 14 here, perhaps. Uh, it has a slightly restricted uh, VGN set and uses this sort of GGG motif. So you might wonder why we have such weird names for these, um, and it wasn't actually our idea. So the original analysis of this paper, which required some manual sequence curation and sort of sequence gazing, they identified these motifs uh, just by kind of more manual work. And we can see here we use V16 and then DWG. Here we have DWG as well. Um, a, a variety of these V genes uh, used and GTIS. We also have this GTIS motif here. And they didn't identify this Ida motif. So I think it's, this is actually just sort of a cool outcome that these people did some work and figured out these important motifs. And then we ran our automated pipeline and the top two things that popped out were exactly what they identified. So that is nice. Uh, and just to convince you that these are actually authentic motifs. What I've done is split up things into sequences that match the three different motifs and uh, plotted the prevalence of different cell subsets uh, in terms of the sequences that fit those motifs. So here we can see that double negative is shifted to the right compared to these other sequences, in particular uh, compared to CD4. Double negative is shifted to the right as well. Um, you know, compared to, so shifted to the right means it's prevalent only in this double negative repertoire. And then interestingly, this item motif is present in the double negative and the CD8 repertoire. So why might we care about doing this? Uh, these motifs are now trackable markers in the repertoire and Paul's lab can go back and answer questions like this, like uh, what do these TCRs recognize? So they can clone TCRs for the epitope discovery. Do they correlate with any particular T cell phenotype or determine their lineage? For that, they can do single cell gene expression ECR. Uh, and also, what is their role in disease and homeostasis? And for that, they can do transgenic T cells. OK, uh, just a few clarifications. I wanted to point out that uh, this work would not have been possible if we had tried to first do dimension reduction. So here, we've done uh, dimension reduction to two dimensions uh, and then plotted our various sequences with their motif labels, we can see that we have mixing between the crosses and the squares. And then there's triangle, there's triangles up here that are mixing with other things. Anyway, we would not be able to, to perform this analysis if we did dimension reduction first and then use clustering techniques there. 
I would also like to contrast it with Alice. So Alice is this really neat approach developed by Pogarelli uh, Minervina in 2019. And this is I would, something I would call a parametric model-based approach. So what Alice says is if you see a TCR that has many more neighbors than, than you would expect based on a null distribution of TCRs, then it says that's an interesting cluster of TCRs. In contrast, our optimal transport is sort of non-parametric. There's no models underlying uh, optimal transport. So uh, if you like statistical tests, you can imagine Alice as being something like a t-test. T-test makes this normal distribution assumption. An optimal transport can be something like a Mann-Whitney U. So it's a bit of a loose analogy, but maybe that helps uh, clarify what the difference is between these tests. So um, just to conclude this part, the optimal transport framework enables detailed comparison of repertoires in a space defined by a distance. We applied it to find groups of sequences that are typical of their repertoire, but atypical of a second repertoire. And then we found interesting groups of sequences extending previous results without careful data cleaning or sequence gazing. And this is sort of just the beginning. If it seems like this is leading in an interesting way, I think there's lots of other ways that we could use these optimal transport matrices. So let's shift gears and imagine we're going out for beers. Uh, this will be somewhere between a whirlwind and going out for beers. I'm not sure beers in a tornado um, because I don't have a whole lot of time and I wanted to cover a couple different things. So I will phrase these as posing questions to you. So if you reconstruct the ancestral BCR sequences, how strong is the evidence for those ancestral sequences? And the bad news is that there's typically a lot of tree uncertainty in phylogenetic inference for BCRs. So I should say ancestral sequences, sometimes people call these intermediate lineage ancestors or something like that. But basically, we have a bunch of sequences. We want to understand what the, the pathway of affinity maturation was. Uh, but the good news is that by using Bayesian phylogenetic techniques, we can integrate out the tree uncertainty and evaluate uncertainty on the level of ancestral sequences directly. And just to illustrate what that looks like, here's an analysis from a recent preprint, which is sort of going through review, where what this is showing is all the different possible paths that we inferred in our phylogenetic analysis about how things could have occurred. This is the naive cell, and this is a sampled cell. We wanted to understand what is the path, uh, the affinity maturation path for these uh, sequences. And it's common just to sort of build one tree reconstruct some ancestral sequences and then start making those in the lab and testing them for function. But with this new perspective, what we're able to do is actually say, okay, this one we're quite certain about and this one we're quite certain about. So let's go ahead and test those instead of these others that we're not so sure about because we didn't know if these are actually authentic ancestral sequences. So we've taken this to, I think it's farthest extent in this recent paper in PLOS Comp Bio, where uh, this is a phylogenetic hidden Markov model, which means that there's some uh, a, a hidden Markov model that describes the possible recombinations at the root, and then a phylogenetic model down here. And so this basically incorporates the ancestral sequence uh, uncertainty that we have in the phylogenetic tree, along with uncertainty as to what the VDJ recombination event was. And one of the take homes for that paper is that for some important lineages like uh, VRCO1, we still find a lot of ancestral sequence uncertainty. And I just don't think that we necessarily have the data that we need to resolve exactly what that ancestral lineage was. Okay. Oh, yes. And also a public service, annou uh, service announcement, which is that there is this beautiful phylogenetic inference program called BEAST. I think it's amazing, but I don't think it's appropriate for BCR lineages. And you can ask me about that offline if you want. So um, when you identify BCR clonal lineage with sequences of interest, how do you pick sequences that may have high affinity? So this is also a common thing to do where people have uh, a clonal lineage that, that they've identified as having some interesting properties and they want to do something test to test them. And so we had this idea, let's, test a, let's train a machine learning model to use this evolutionary and sequence level information to predict good binders. And the project sort of collapsed because uh, the only feature that was needed was basically how close we are to the consensus of the clonal lineage. So we don't need a model. Just pick sequences that are close to the consensus of the clonal lineage and definitely not the most mutated sequences. And this goes a little bit in the flies in the face of uh, what is commonly done, which is to pick very highly mutated sequences. But uh, according to our computational analysis and also 
some sort of more recent data that we've been playing with with Gabriel Victor's lab, it really doesn't seem like these most mutated sequences are necessarily very good binders at all. So this is published this year. Um, one more uh, project that we have been doing on, do, working on that I just love, uh, which is trying to understand the like, SARS-CoV-2 serological response. So just a quick primer on FIPSeq, phage uh, immunoprecipitation sequencing. You make a phage library displaying epitopes of interest, and you incubate with an antibody, and then you can pull down the phage uh, via those antibodies, and you can sequence those phage and some controls. And this tells you uh, what did these antibodies that you sort of just pull out of the blood uh, actually bind in terms of what the epitopes are that you're presenting on the outside of the phage. So that's nice and relatively well established. Our collaborators in the Overbot lab I wanted to understand how well do antibodies recognize mutant peptides. And you know what? There's actually nothing that says you can't actually just put lots of mutant peptides in this phage library as well. So that's exactly what they did. And I'm just going to show a big scary results figure, uh, but let me try to walk you through it. So here we have a partition between uh, patients, patients uh, 1, 3, 8, and 12. Here we have serum from 30 days post uh, symptom onset and 60 days PSO. This is indexed uh, on this x-axis by protein position and then on this y-axis by amino acids. So what does this mean? The dots here mean this is what the wild type is. So the wild type um, we set to be basically zero. And uh, when we move away from something that has something a dot, then that's going to modify that uh, amino acid. And, and so red means that when we modified that amino acid, then it changed the binding. So red means it decreased the binding. So let's look at this one right here. Hopefully people can see my cursor. There's this brick here that's red, and it's just above a, a dot here. So we can see that if we change the site uh, at 820 from a D to an E, then that reduces the binding a lot of the antibody response. And what's interesting is, let's just click over to this other person. So this person, when we change that D to an E, it doesn't change binding at all. So that means that this that these two people are, are binding their um, this part of the SARS-CoV-2 fusion peptide in rather different ways. And that's, I think, a, quite an interesting conclusion. So if you're interested, you can read more about uh, that in this paper. So yes, the result is the escape pathway for the virus, which is exactly what we're assaying, uh, and that differs between patients. Cool. So other things that are in the pipeline, we are still working on probabilistic mechanistic models of somatic type mutation. We're working on modeling epistasis in antigens and antibodies. We're in collaborative work. We're working on a GWAS to understand how genetics shapes TCR repertoire. Uh, we're doing a HIV antibody deep mutational scan. And also, we're working on finding broad and potent anti-dengue antibodies with the GULA. And of course, yes, we do love Bayesian phylogenetics. So I will stop there uh, and say thank you again to the collaborators for the main part. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Amrit, Duncan, and Vladimir for their analyses I've described. Uh, and then for the FIPSeq, Caitlin, Megan, Jared, um, and Julie Overbaugh's lab have been great collaborators. Like to thank funding, and if this work interests you, drop me a line. And I just wanted to say, just sort of in general, uh, I am currently in a building that's I'm actually sitting right here, right, or standing right here right now. Uh, it's a great spot that's filled with people doing computational biology and immunotherapy, and we, there's lots of people who have uh, open positions around. So if you're interested at any level, be it a programmer, postdoc, or aspiring faculty member, please drop me a line. And I should also say, actually, Adaptive's world headquarters is being built right next door. So they are moving right next door to us. OK, so I think I'll stop there. And hopefully, I wasn't muted the whole time. You are not. And thank you for that wonderful tornado of beer. <laughs> All right, uh, we have time for questions. So first question is from Philippa, and it says, you showed us motif analysis just for the CDR3s of TCR beta. Um, how do you include all the other CDRs for alpha and beta? Uh, 
Okay, so first I should clarify that that TCR dist uh, is defined in terms of alpha and beta chains. This particular data set was just TCR beta. Um, and so there's no problem just using TCR beta data. Um, well, let's see. So I guess the motifs for the other CDRs in TCR beta are included in what the vGene is. Um, so it's sort of fully specified. I didn't show JGene information, which would have also, which is helpful, but um, we were just using like the vGene and the CDR for this particular analysis. Uh, we have another question from Anonymous, uh, but I have a related question, so I'll package them together. Um, regarding the optimal transport section, uh, when you said you couldn't get the results using um, dimensional reduction as your first step, um, the question is, what was the input to the dimensional reduction? And my add-on to that question is, what kind of dimensional reduction? Linear, nonlinear, there's a giant pile of them. And may have offended somebody by saying it's impossible entirely. <laughs> well, OK. Um, so let me step back a little bit and just talk about dimension reduction in general and spaces. So it's a mathematical fact that, uh, that you cannot take a distance matrix and project it down to any dimensional Euclidean space and preserve those pairwise distances. Um, there's a whole field sort of about this. Um, and it just has to do with those that you can have certain incompatibilities within the distances that cannot be represented as a Euclidean distance in Euclidean space. Um, there, if you want to look it up, there's like measures of distortion. And there's sort of inherent reasons why you can't get a zero distortion embedding in a, a Euclidean space. So that's, I guess, my general answer. So this particular analysis, um, and I mean, I should say we didn't systematically evaluate this, so maybe I shouldn't emphasize that. And I'm sorry if I've offended someone. Um, but this particular analysis was just two dimensions and, um, and using multidimensional scaling. So sorry if I offended you, but um, I, yeah, I think that there, like the fact remains that um, there are inherent reasons why you can't take an arbitrary distance matrix and project it down to Euclidean space. And if you if you want me to start doing an analysis of like to what extent there is distortion in the TCR space, I'd be so excited. So please ask me that. <laughs> you definitely didn't offend anyone. That was just a. Um, we have another question from uh, Bo. What is the computational cost for TCR disk plus optimal transport? Um, and how well yeah. does that scale? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so TCR disk, uh, I haven't actually run it myself, but I mean, obviously, that's an O of n squared computation. And O of n squared gets pretty big when you have big repertoires. Um, so O of n squared, what, what that means is it's sort of like there's uh, o, there's sort of like a quadratic number of entries in, in, in any pairwise distance matrix. I think that we can get around that with using some just some light clustering um, to avoid having to compute so many. I mean, it is fast. I mean, I'm, Phil wrote it in C++, and I, I think CCR distance computation is fast. As far as the optimal transport side of things, amazingly, this used to be a super, super, super hard problem with these, but with these entropy regularized techniques, it feels sort of like oh, in log n, or even linear for some approximations. So, excuse me. Uh, so I think it's reasonably scalable. Uh, we haven't tried to push it too hard, but uh, if if you're interested in pushing it harder, let me know. Um, an additional question from Filippo. Um, I'm not quite sure what the final goal of TCR analysis, uh, but do you worry about NK, uh, NKT cell receptors in which the alpha chain is almost invariant and many TCR beta show up? I didn't quite follow that. So uh, let me reparse. Hold on. Um, so is, are your results potentially confounded by largely invariant 
T cell receptors such as those found in NK T cells? Potentially. I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'm afraid this is, that, that part is not my domain of expertise. Uh, Haim asks, do you need to subsample the repertoires to be the same size for optimal transport? If so, do you get better results with multiple iterations? No, and that's sort of cool. Uh, all, all you need to do is uh, just take each PCR and label it with its frequency, and then you're off to the races, because everything gets normalized by sort of one over the frequency of that TCR. I mean, that said, if you have a truly, truly massive sample and a truly sparse one, that probably is something of a problem, more just a problem that if you have very sparse sampling, that's going to be an issue. And uh, last question, so, and then we will actually be back on time. Um, Alexander asks, the cluster profiles from the lonely sequences, how are these motifs defined? Are these clusters discrete? or do the clusters sometimes overlap? Uh, they don't overlap. Um, so, and, and it actually allows me to say something that I didn't say before. So they're defined by basically we start with very lonely TCRs and then keep on expanding out until it seems like we reach this sort of elbow in the mean loneliness for a ring of sequences of a given radius. And then once we have that ensemble of clusters, that's our, our of sequences, we can then <clears throat> use this profile HMM. And then, and so with that sort of core set of sequences, and then if we want to evaluate whether another sequence is a member of that cluster, we can set a threshold in terms of the, the probability that that sequence was generated by this profile HMM, which is exactly what Hammer is supposed to evaluate. So I'll just say that one more time. So we have a core set of sequences that were defined using the previous procedure. We build this profile HMM after making a multiple sequence alignment. And then we can decide if another sequence is a member of that uh, profile HMM by evaluating that's something that's sort of analogous to a BLAST score, but it's sort of the hammer version of the BLAST score. Um, uh, I should have clarified. I mean, you can ask about any of the other projects, but I guess people were interested about OT, so that's cool. All right. So thank you, everyone, to all of our speakers in the morning session. Um, we have scheduled a short break until 8.55, and then we will return with a couple of short talks.